well, several things uh, present themselves today. It is Remembrance Sunday, first of all, when we remember the dead of the two wo world and other subsequent wars. The next year will be the centenary of the beginning of World War I. We remember especially the dead of our own country, commemorated in so many villages and towns, uh, but not only. I read once that it was estimated that in the 20th century, some 165 million people died from violent causes. And that was a figure uh, arrived at before the end of the century. So even more now and carrying on into our own century. It's an astonishing and terrible figure, 165 million people. I think I'm right in saying that Remembrance Sunday is owed to World War I ending at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. But it fits very well with the Catholic practice of remembering uh, the holy souls, the faithful departed in this month, commemorating them especially on the 2nd of November, but remembering them all through the month. And I think we bring our own perspective to these commemorations. It's a perspective that Jesus opens in the Gospel today when he speaks of those judged worthy of a place in the other world and in the resurrection from the dead. It's a perspective uh, these doughty seven brothers uh, of the first reading had even before Christ. In the human fiend you may discharge us from this present life, but the king of the world will raise us up, since it is for his laws that we die to live again forever. The resurrection from the dead, to live again forever. So we bring hope and prayer for the departed into this remembering. We remember the future that is promised by God, as well as the past that has been so often ruined by us. And can't we pray for something else as well? All the, all the popes of our own time, all the way back to Benedict the 15th, 15th during the First World War, have called for peace. It's said that St. Pius X, who died in 1914, shortly after the outbreak of the, the First World War, died of a broken heart. But they have all called for peace. Pope Benedict XV in 1917 made a concrete proposal for peace during the war, but it was unfortunately rejected. But Pope Francis appealed for peace recently in regard, and in regard to Syria. And several of the popes have been bold enough been disciples of Christ enough to ask the question, can't humanity move beyond war? Can't humanity decide that it is not the way to resolve disputes, not even as a last resort? Can't we put war in the past? And this is really, especially at a time when uh, we have weapons capable of re wreaking incalculable and long-term destruction. Is this really so absurd? But anyway, let us have a peace as a prayer, an intention, a desire, a longing in our hearts, something to bring before God, something for God to see in our hearts and respond to. Well then, in, in that rather gruesome, uh, gory first reading, and also touched on in the second, we come to another kind of war, not simply the war of humanity against humanity, 
but a war on faith. The first reading comes from the second book of Maccabees and is relating events that happened about 160 years before Christ. And at that time, Israel was part of something called the Seleucid Empire, which was basically Greek. Uh, and his ruler had, I suppose you'd call them, ideological pretensions, and he wished that everyone in his empire would follow the same customs, would do as the Greeks did. And so Jewish customs, like circumcision or abstention from pork and observance of the Sabbath, were outlawed. But for the Jews, of course, these things were the signs of loyalty to the covenant that God had made with them. They were expressions of their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the bolder among them would not compromise, and hence the story of this remarkable family, the mother with her seven sons. Well, the story does have uh, that whole story of the Maccabean persecution does have something of a contemporary ring. Uh, societies often don't like too much diversity or want to impose one value system and not allow disagreement. But it is a mystery, isn't it, that, that when God uh, approaches humanity, and he draws near to us, as he does through creation, and then more so through the law of Moses and the prophets, and then, in a, in a climactic way through Christ, his approach is rejected. We don't like it. We don't welcome it. We don't want God to get too close to us. And what was done to Christ on the cross is the lasting sign of that. Now St. Paul in the second reading speaks of bigoted and evil people opposing the gospel, opposing the faith. Well, uh, this does go on. Uh, I read a brief report the other day that most European Jews feel at the moment that anti-Semitism is on the rise and uh, for us Christians I think the situation worldwide is even darker. Just a few years ago uh, a commission of the European bishops that follows political developments in Europe and in the world produced a report which said that Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world at the present time, and that some hundred million Christians uh, today are suffering various forms of persecution, not necessarily to death, but things like intimidation and so forth throughout the world. And you'll have heard of the body called the Association um, Gosh, the ACN, Aid to the Churches in Need, to Christians in Need, something like that, has published a report covering the period from 2011 to 2013. And the result of that report, the picture that emerges from that, that report, and it's all very professional and seriously done, is that the worldwide situation is getting worse for Christians, especially in the Middle East, where there's, there's so much turmoil in countries in Asia and Africa where radical Islamism is at work, uh, in places where another religion is in the ascendant and uh, unwilling to tolerate the presence of other faiths. That's there's something of that apparently in Sri Lanka and in Burma and in some still communist countries most notably North Korea. So in 20, out of the 30 countries surveyed, the situation for Christians has got worse over the last two years. 
well, here are just some random figures. Between January and October 2012, last year, 1,201 Christians were killed uh, because they were Christians, because of their faith. And seven of those, 791 were in Nigeria, in northern Nigeria. And in one diocese there, in the north of Nigeria, which has 37 parishes, half the churches have been destroyed. Uh, in Egypt, since August of this year, and there was the coup, some 80 churches and Christian establishments have been destroyed. There are deaths, but more often there is just fear, intimidation, destruction of property, and so on. And many Christians will move out of these countries if they can. In Iraq, not so long ago, there were almost one and a half million Christians. Well, there are now 300,000. And there is a real danger that Christianity will disappear from some Middle Eastern countries altogether. And this has affected you know, everyone in the church. Or in the churches, and it's not, often, it's not only Catholics who are affected by this, but lay people, obviously, and families, and religious, and priests, and bishops as well. It's not a pretty picture, and it's real, and it's happening now. So perhaps it's not just St. Paul who is speaking to us in peaceful Aberdeen but our fellow Christians as well. Finally, brothers, pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message may spread quickly and be received with honor. Pray that we may be preserved from the interference of bigoted and evil people, for faith is not given to everyone. And what did we hear at the Alleluia? Stay awake. Praying at all times for the strength to can stand with confidence before the Son of Man. Our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father have given us, Paul says, a sure hope. He actually says, a good hope. This is the hope that Jesus speaks of in the Gospel. The hope that God is God of the living, not the dead. But Christ himself underwent a brutal and meaningless death, apparently meaningless. But in that death was every death, all deaths, including yours and mine yet to be. And by the alchemy of who he was as the Son of God, by the alchemy of his divine and human love, he changed death, he overcame it, he proved greater than it, and because he rose, everyone can rise with him. The Son of God makes us children of the resurrection. This is the good hope of which we speak. This is what enables so many of our fellow Christians to stand firm today. And for us, I think the great expression of hope, St. Thomas Aquinas says this, the great expression of hope is surely prayer. So let us pray for the dead and pray for the living. The Lord is the Lord of both. <laughs>